So the IETF is, oh my God, this down just a little bit. The IETF is chartered to do BPF standardization, and what does that mean? If we look at the working group charter of what the IETF has agreed to do, right? So the charter is basically a commitment to publish a certain set of things with a set of criteria, right? This is a list of things that the IETF has committed to publish. You see little letters left next to the bullets, P, S, and I, right? Those stand as the top says, proposed standard and informational. Proposed standard means it's something that an implementation you actually claim conformance to. Informational means that, well, conformance doesn't ha necessarily have a strong meaning. It's information, maybe background reading, maybe things that don't have to affect an implementation, or could just be things that aren't ready for standardization. It's just documenting how the world works already, right? Okay. Uh, and so I want to walk through a couple of points in here, but the, when this was formed, these were put into approximately chronological order of completion. Okay? Doesn't mean that you have to uh, not start the second one until the first one is finished and so on all the way down. So this doesn't mean it's seven times the time it takes to do the very first one because you can start to have parallelization. But the working group decided, well, we want to test the process first, and so we kind of punted everything else until the ISA document was done. And so basically the first one is not in parallel with anything else, and then after that we can start to parallelize things. Uh, David Vernay back here is one of the working group chairs, and so uh, thanks for being here. The technical advisors for the working group are myself and Christoph, who's also here. So we got the main three names associated with the working group, other than Suresh, in the room right here if there's questions. I guess Alexi is another one, right? So, okay. All right. So I'm going to start from the top there. The current state of the ISA document is almost done. So what do we mean by that? Okay. So the current, there's a couple of states that get tracked when you look in datatracker.ietf.org. One is the state inside the working group, and the working group state says, we're done, it's submitted to the IESG for publication, meaning it's on to the next stage right now. The next stage is not the end, okay? So let me walk through the rest of what happens after the working group says that it's done, okay? So the IESG is a set of area directors. They're the ones that actually approve what becomes an RFC. RFCs being the, the all standards are RFCs. Not all RFCs are standards. And so the IESG is the collection of people that individually get to ballot that this thing is ready to become an RFC, right? So it becomes an RFC once the ballot at the IESG level passes, okay? What IESG does is they kind of delegate reviews on specific areas because the IESG has like security experts and routing experts and internet expert, internet area experts, you know, network layer experts and so on. So they will often delegate it to review teams to say, give me a review so the area director knows how to ballot so they don't have to read line by line every document that's up there so they can ballot because they have a set of trusted advisors. Okay, so that's what the area or um, directorate reviews are. And you can see three of those are scheduled and you can see IETF last call. When it says in last call up there that ends tomorrow, that means wide mail that goes out across across the entire IETF that says if anybody out there hasn't been participating in the working group, last call, things that we haven't thought about yet, please get those in. The deadline is tomorrow, okay? Um, and I'll tell you everything that's come in so far, and right now I'm guessing nothing will come in between right now and tomorrow, but you know, we'll see. Um, but there is a dot, dot, dot on the slides. So three areas. Uh, you can see the first one has already submitted their review, which is the operations and management area. Their review in entirety was ready, as always, well considered and well written. Usually the things come with a bunch of comments and stuff. That's actually high praise for, uh, from one of them, okay? Other ones, two of them are due tomorrow, which is general and security area. Um, and so I expect we'll get some comments tomorrow, whether they're short like that or whether they contain things. Um, and then dot, dot, dot means there could be other area directors that have asked for similar things that could still get to the pier by approximately tomorrow, okay? Um, after those come in, then what happens is it goes on the agenda for an IESG uh, virtual meeting where they actually just ballot. And they usually don't have strong technical discussion. They just go down the status and say, any objections? Is this thing ready or not? And they've already typically submitted a ballot before the meeting, okay? And so that hasn't been put on the calendar yet. And so uh, the IESG meets typically every or every other Thursday. And so the last call for comments ends tomorrow. So I might expect the IESG to put it on the agenda sometime and maybe it's up to them. In this case, it's actually up to Eric Klein, who's the sponsoring area director. Um, separately, the IANA is the organization that manages the registries. 
and there's a section in the document that says instructions to IANA. If somebody wants to get another, you know, op code or something, there's a process to find, which in this case involves going to IANA and asking them, and IANA then reaches out to a designated expert, which the working group gets to recommend who that is, and so that, you know, could be Alexi and Daniel, whatever it is that, that the working group chairs want to recommend and that Eric accepts. And, but IANA has to say, is the instructions that's in the document sufficient for us to follow, right? Because it, IANA doesn't, they're not technical experts. They're just process people and they say, well, here's the steps to follow when somebody sends us a request. We need to do X, Y, and Z. Make sure the following information is there. Here's who we send it to and so on and that stuff gets documented. So they have a review that they go through and say, is this stuff clear or do we have some clarifying questions to what the instructions to us are, okay? That hasn't happened yet either. Okay. So there could be some feedback on that section that says we need more clarity as to what we're supposed to do from IANA. Okay. So that's what's happened and what hasn't happened. Um, there are future states, okay. things that it hasn't gone through yet. Here's the steps that happen afterwards. And these, get these get our, uh, show up in the data tracker for each document. You can see the states of the working group, the state of the ISG, and the state of IANA, the state of the RFC editor, and so on. So there's waiting for AD go ahead. This is the state that it will probably be in after tomorrow or whenever Eric gets to pushing the button after tomorrow, which just means last call is closed and there might have been some comments and Eric is waiting for those comments to be addressed such that he's happy with it. And so that just means that we have some opportunity. It'll be in that state until we've addressed the things. I'm gonna tell you what the feedback is so far. It's editorial stuff. Um, once he's happy with that, once we've made those changes, then it'll move into IESG evaluation that means the secretary puts it on the agenda for the meeting, um, along with any other documents that are there. Uh, if the ballots then uh, raise questions from IESG members themselves, then it'll move into this revised ID needed that says some area director said, here's something else that you guys didn't cover before that I want to discuss uh, afterwards, and they would usually put it only in there needed once we already agree that, yeah, that's right, we need to make that fix, right? Otherwise, it would be stuck in ISG evaluation until we actually agree, yes, the area director is right, we, we should clarify that wording. Once that happens, and I should say that, that step could actually be skipped, right, if there are no such things, okay? Then it moves into the RFC editor queue, that's when the ballots say, yep, pass, and pass just means most people that are not experts in technology vote no objection, um, you got to have at least two votes of yes, and that should be easy, and, and um, no votes of no, okay? And votes of no are people that say, you know, revised ID needed, right? Okay. Once it's in the RFC editor's queue, the document is basically done, but it's in internet draft format, and so the RFC editor's job is to transform it from something that looks like an internet draft to something that looks like an RFC, okay? They're almost identical, but things like the boilerplate at the top and the bottom are different. Um, things like, are there any references that are now out of date? Um, are there, uh, you know, what's the copyright notice on there? Things like that, that they just do um, transforms. But they also do a pass by an editor that says, are there typos in there? Are there grammatical errors, right? Not for technical ones, but are there actually English errors in there, right? And so there may be changes that come in, as, you know, if there's typos, right? We don't think that there are, but sometimes they'll suggest wording changes. Um, but those are a suggest, and so if they do, um, then what happens is they make those in a red line version, they send that to the authors and the working group chairs and the area directors, and it moves into the state called Auth48, and it'll move into this regardless of whether they make changes. Once they've changed the boilerplate, this says, here's a camera ready copy. Before we actually publish it, can you check to make sure we didn't break it when we did the transform? Okay. So then the authors, the working group chairs and stuff get a chance to check that the transformation didn't actually change anything of importance, right? Yeah, you can change the header that says it's an RFC and it has a number that's on it instead of the internet draft version and, and so on. But otherwise the content looks right. It shows up correctly in PDF. It shows up correctly in HTML. It shows up correctly in plain text and so on. So that's the job. Historically, it's been called Auth48. The number comes from, you're supposed to be able to do it in 48 hours. In practice, the 48 is not 48, it's whenever people get to it, and so don't take that too literally, but that's where the 48 comes from. Um, meaning, we have 48 hours, but it's you know when we get to it, um, and hopefully it's less than that, but you never know. And then finally, once Auth48 is passed, and the authors, editors, working group chairs all say, yep, looks great, and then it actually shows up in the downloadable repository, and at this point here, RFC published, it is immutable. You can never make changes to it. 
Right? You can replace it with a higher numbered RFC, but you can never change it. At this point, it's called a proposed standard. Okay? Up until then, it's not a proposed standard. Technically, once you pass IESG evaluation, it's approved as a proposed standard, but it's not yet published as one, right? because you can have you know, tweaks like this that fix wording and so on. Okay? So this is the steps coming forward. And so now you might be asking, well, how long does it take to get these? Okay. The next IETF meeting, uh, the next IETF face-to-face -face meeting is in uh, late July. My goal is that we should be past the bottom of this by then. Okay. As you saw uh, up here, the ISG evaluation, they may, it may be two weeks in this state and two weeks in this state and so on. But by the end of July, that's my crystal ball guess, is this should happen before the IETF meets next, before the working group meets, has an official meeting. Okay. That's the goal in terms of how long things would typically take in uh, documents that are in the state that I think that this document is in. Okay. Yeah. David, do you want to say something? You hand up. Is there anything that the folks in here could do to pre prevent slowdowns, or is it just kind of up to the process, and we'll just have to see how, how the rest of the IETF community responds? I, I missed the first part of the question. Is there? Like, it, it, can you foresee anything happening where people in this room could help to facilitate and like make the process go faster? Are we going to be on the critical path at all, or is, there, is it most likely just like IETF community members? Yeah. Like I said, right now it's in the uh, waiting for reviews to come in, right, which is tomorrow, and then waiting for ISG members to file their, their, their information, and waiting for it to get on the, the, the ballot, which should happen real quick once it moves into that state, and then waiting for them to meet, and then they issue the ballots. And so it's roughly just driven by calendar stuff. There's really nothing we can do to speed it up. Well, all we can do to speed it up is whenever there is a comment to address the comment as fast as possible. Right? So I'll mention what the open issues are right now. So what I'm doing to speed that up is I'm telling you what they are right now so that we can then try to file any patches you know, this week such that uh, by the time anybody gets around to doing something, we will have already patched it and we won't be blocking the next date. Okay? All right, so this is on specifically on the ISA. So here's the stuff that's come in through IETF last call so far. So we've been on IETF last call for a couple weeks now, and there's been uh, four issues raised. Um, one was, I think, from one of the other area directors, if I remember right, saying, uh, the abstract is inadequate. The abstract is one sentence, and he said, change it to match the introduction. That part is already done, not yet published in the internet draft version, but that's sitting there in the, uh, in, in the queue of the internet draft. Uh, the second one was Eric Klein's review, which we kind of split into two pieces because we extended one thing. So Eric Klein had some language feedback that roughly involved three main points. Okay? The first one is he observed that most RFCs, not all, but most RFCs use language with capital must, capital should, and capital may. We don't. We use lowercase must, lowercase should, and lowercase may. And he said, uh, the working group should decide whether you want to change it. Most RFCs do, but you don't have to. Okay. I think we should do whatever is least controversial for IETF. Yeah. The, the, the path of least resistance and fastest approval by people is to go ahead and change this, meaning all the rest of the IETF. Nobody else will ask if we don't change it. Somebody else is going to ask, and they'll have to point out the previous answer and so on. And so the, yeah, yeah, exactly, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's okay. really what do you expect when you read yeah. an RFC, so I think it would be useful. Yeah. And kind of the follow-on question is, is that something we also want to propagate to the Linux source tree? And I'd probably say yes, but that might be. Uh, the ISA document source right now is in the Linux tree, documentation, BPF, standardization, slash instruction, dash set, dot RST. So that's where we'd actually make this change is in the Linux source tree. And then the tooling takes care of making it appear in the internet draft format. So yes, you'd see a patch, uh, a patch on patchwork for exactly this change that I haven't done yet, uh, but I would say I'd want to get it done this week, so. I think it's probably also important to mention that we're sort of at the point now where like some language tweaks and feedback on like grammatical nits and stuff are probably going to have to happen out of tree and we'll subsequently merge them back in. But you know, uh, uh, it's just impossible yeah. to have a complete unidirectional flow from the entirety of the, the process. So yeah. we should definitely merge whatever changes we make, but I think it, uh, there are going to be instances where we, we have to sort of feed from the IETF as opposed to the other way around. Yeah, so my belief is there's nothing on this slide that's actually technical. It's all about clarifications and, and uh, making things look like IETF people want and so on. So the second comment from Eric was uh, right now it talks about BTF uh, when it talks about uh, calling a function by BTF ID, right? 
Um, when it doesn't specifically say, and you said, it would be nice to have a sentence that says BTF is out of scope for this document and will be covered in a separate document. Right? If we go back to that charter, it's a separate bullet on there. And he says, you know, provide a, uh, an empty future reference here. Sure, we can add a sentence that says that. Um, and then the last one is the one that we kind of moved over to issue 140 to track. So we're using GitHub issues to just track the feedback so far so we can make sure we don't lose any of the, any of the information, any of the feedback. Um, is that in one place in the document, it mentions that the register range is 0 through 10. That's when it defines the destination register 4 bits and the 4 bits for source reg, and it says 0 to 10. And we said that probably doesn't belong there. It belongs in the PSABI. We kind of talked about this, what, two days ago when we talked about API stuff. Um, and so that's what 140 is, uh, because Eric didn't mention um, the fact that it returns um, R0, uh, and probably the answer for that one we think is the same too. And so I would expect for 140 there to just be a sentence or two that's currently in the, ABI, in the ISA document that just moves over into ABI.RST. So I, I actually strongly disagree with that. Okay, go for but, it. But you raised your hand first, so you're. Yeah, Jose? Yeah, so Christoph, we had some of the discussion two days ago and you weren't in the room at the time, so feel free to So I would say that the second part, which is the, the special role of the register zero, that uh, belongs to the API, in my opinion. Th the first are, part... There, there are two things in the, in the ISA. One belongs in there, in my opinion, the other one doesn't and is open for question. The one that belongs in there is atomics, R0 is special in some atomic instructions. Okay, that one belongs in the ISA because it's an inherent property of the instruction. No, but that's a, okay. The part that is in the ISA right now that I'm arguing should move is the part that says, before doing an exit, you must fill in the R0 value for all possible calls, you know, BPF to BPFC calls, which means you can't do a void return and so on. Yeah, but... That's the one that I'm saying should yeah, move that one sentence. Okay. Return zero, I assume that, that, mean, that it refers to the role of R0 in the calling convention. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. That's typically found in ABIs. Yeah. yeah. As now, opposed to the role in the atomic that uses R0, that stays in the ISA because that's an yeah, property. Yeah, but that's not yeah. about atomic. That says that yeah. return R0, right? That's what you are talking about. Yeah. Okay. There's one sentence in there that says you have to return R0 uh, before doing an exit. Okay. The 0 to 10 as register range, I assume that that refers to the valid values that you can put in register fields in instructions. In the four bits of an instruction, um, when, right. those, when those four bits are actually referring to a register, right. Right, as opposed it, to being reused for some other purpose, which some instructions do, when referring to a register, right now it says it has to be 0 through 10, which means that we could never add a register 11, 12, or 13 without revving the ISA. And that's what we don't want to do, is we want to be able to right, revve that right. without but, changing but, the ISA. But that's, can, can I please finish? Thanks. Yeah. So, if that's the range of valid, of valid values that you can put in those fields to refer to registers, that's something that I will say traditionally belongs to, the, to this document, not to the ABI, that's for sure. But that's what I wanted to say. Okay, I want to hear from Christoph. Yes, and, and sorry for interrupting you, but I was just violently agreeing with you. <laughs> with who, me or Jose? So I, in, in, in any instruction set specification, the number of registers is part of the instruction set and not the PSABI. And I, I yeah. don't see any good reason to diverge from that here. The reason is because this, is, this can be running on multiple architectures. If we're running on ARM versus, versus x86, we have a ton of extra registers. No, no, no. Why, but, not, but, why not take advantage? But, but, but EBPF is portable. It does no, not so matter I, what I, I you agree, run on. I agree with Christoph and, uh, and Jose. Like the number of register and register of one to zero, zero, zero to 10, that we have them, it's part of the instruction set today, yes. right? So the meaning of registers, that's, that's different. Yes, except whoa, 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 for R0, uh, agreed. What changed your mind from your presentation yesterday? <laughs> <laughs> that's Nothing, like number of registers, like this is, this is the ISA we have. Tomorrow we'll have like 20 registers, but that's different, right? But that's an instruction set revision, yeah. Yes, right. yes. But, Yeah, yesterday, well, two days ago, we talked, like, just three of us about, like, definition of R10, whether to mention yeah. that this is, like, frame point or stack point or whatever. So this part is, I yeah. think, like, should not be part of the uh, ISA because, like, mm -hmm. this is, like, 
like you can like there is like this frame the compilers pick this frame point or whatever, no preserve uh, FP and then RBP on x86 become different. So that's part of P PSABI, and that's why I'm saying well, let's not talk about what R10 yeah. does in ISA doc okay. and move to PSABI. That's I thought what we're discussing. But total yeah. number of registers zero to ten that's part of ISA. There is no like questions okay. about it. So what I'm hearing from Christoph and Alexei is that we should keep the 0 to 10 as the valid range of registers in the ISA document. I didn't hear a specific comment on whether you must return R0 before doing an exit, which document that should be in. PSABI. Okay. The, that the function is supposed to like return Good. stuff in R0, yeah, that's PSABI. Okay. So that uh, atomic compare exchange yeah, yeah. is using R0 of as course. part of the operations. Of course, that's, that's always ISA. I Okay, so uh, if Sir, this is the consensus, can, including can I, can the IETF, then it means that I'll just move a single sentence, which is the one about the R0 return, not the, not the atomic stuff, and not touch the 0 to 10 register range stuff. David? I don't want to derail the discussion, but I, I don't really see any practical reason that we would have chosen 0 to 10 based on anything other than existing conventions. I mean, if, the, if we have four bits in the, uh, the ISA, why are we leaving those other registers on the table? I mean, I, I'm confused. That, that is a very good question, but not a question that should affect the standard. That's. But I just don't see, like, I don't even think it's it stops us from It's what all existing it. interoperable eBPF code needs to do. And if you think that was a bad idea and all 16 should be used, we can rev it, but maybe not in the last call of this so, standard, so but clear, for the fine. next one. No, that's, that's fine. It's just I, I, I would have thought that removing it and not specifying that you can only use up to 10 would have but that just like means you can't write interoperable code because people don't know how many registers they have. I mean, okay. as in the instruction set as defined right now, it's part of the instruction set. It turns out the encoding allows more, and it might be beneficial to, at some point, do a revision that actually allows all 16 registers. But apparently, there was no urgent need for that until now, and everything works with the 11 registers, so that's what we should standardize. Okay, so uh, okay. I'm okay either way, but I would say that uh, when you talked about you can't write interoperable code, I think there's a valid argument that there's a bunch of stuff in the PSABI that you need to know in order to write interoperable code. Uh, and so it's not a strong argument either way for me. That's why I can go either way on this one. Uh, that's why I was saying we should just not even say <laughs> 0 to 10. But if you guys think we need to include it, that's fine. It's just I don't, I don't see like... If functionally, it feels to me like PSA. How, how are you going to write a compiler that doesn't know how many registers you have? How are you going to write a compiler that doesn't know the stuff that's in the ABI document? You can't. Just stand up. <laughs> Sorry. I guess something that you could do, perhaps, is to, in the ASA document, you could say, OK, so you have a space for up to 16 registers. But it depends on the implementation, how many you have. You can have a minimum of 10. Yeah, I know, I know, but. Uh, uh. I mean, look, I, it doesn't okay. really matter. I mean, the, the, the typical way, if this actually was an issue and people had a real need for the other ones, we seem to have a mostly theoretical discussion right now. Is, I mean, the 11 registers is literally what all running code does, and this is what we should standardize. But yeah, we can put in a sentence, the encoding allows for up to 16 registers. Use of registers 12 to 15 is undefined. Mm -hmm. No. Yeah. Okay. So zero to uh, ten's fine. Yeah. It's okay. Let's move on. Yeah. So all, all it means is that uh, when we do get around to saying we want to use like registers eleven, twelve, and thirteen, as Alexei suggests, was one of the ways to to, to to do things like you know passing additional arguments into into calls instead of just R one through five and so on. If you ever want to do that, it just means you need to have a document that would update the ISA document. You can do that. Sorry. No. We're saying if we don't, if we don't change the language in the ISA right now, which is what I heard you and Christoph both arguing to not change the language around the zero to ten. Okay, that means if you want to allow a register eleven, you got to change the ISA by yes. having another so document that updates it. Can I just one, one more quick thing I want to add? Like I'm, I'm, I'm okay with keeping it in here, but we realize that if we actually want to use those extra registers, we'd have to do an entire new standard instead of just saying, okay, now we have an eleven no. uh, register eleven, no. twelve. I, well, that's I, one of the I, concerns I that we had last year okay. regarding yeah. whether handling this as a standard actually. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean you're entire new standard is yeah. going to be a half page RFC Correct. that says uh, eBPF version 2, well, updates, yep. RFC number, whatever, That's right. and now we have 16 registers. And 
maybe we actually have a few other things by then, but that would be the minimum viable one. Correct. But that assumes a need actually arise, and so far it hasn't. Why would it suddenly <laughs> arise? <laughs> See previous presentations, right? So, all right. So, um, by the way, da the Daniel and Joe gave me permission Dave, to run long. Not so. derailing the discussion. <laughs> No, zero to ten is fine. Come on, guys. Let's. Yeah, we're talking like hypothesizing too much into the future. All right. So, uh, David, you heard all of this. It's your job to call consensus, and of course, this is not an IETF meeting, and so we have to put it on the the, the, the list too. But uh, but chances are, the people that are actually going to comment are sitting here in this room. So, if we have consensus here, chances are that'll be the consensus of the list. So, all right. Should we go on? Okay. Um, then, uh, so then there was another comment that um, if you know what's going on, it's clear enough, but there was a request for clarification. And here's the argument for the request for clarification. In other words, right now in like the arithmetic um, instruction section, right, there's a number of examples, right? So for example, this tuple means the following thing. This tuple means the following thing. And so the suggestion was to add two more examples, right? One in the um, arithmetic instruction section and one in the uh, jump instruction section. And the reason is it could be misread, okay? Uh, if you actually are an astute reader, it's pretty clear enough, but um, uh, people new to BPF are easily confused. And so here's the argument, right? The move32 instruction says dest equals source. And so that means when source is immediate as opposed to a register, when the source operand is immediate, um, this means it does an unsign. In other words, it's a zero extension as opposed to a sign extension like the move SX instruction, right? But it doesn't actually explicitly say that it's unsigned. You're supposed to know that, right? And so the, 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 the suggestion was put an example in there that says, when doing this as a AOU32 operation, then it's copying the 32 bits and leaving the upper ones as zero. Put that in as an explicit example, okay? Um, and the reason that that's a little bit confusing is that when you look in instructions like JLE, it says PC plus equals offset if dest is less than or equal to source, where comparison is <coughs> unsigned. Okay, and so given the move 32 doesn't say, that means you can't tell which of these it is, right? Because is it more like the, the, the JLE or is it more like something else? And so hence the, the, the advice to say between those two, the answer is the bottom one, not the top one. In other words, if B is the correct answer, A is the wrong answer, okay? And so just put that as the example in the document. That's what the request for clarification was, okay? We all agree on what the correct behavior is. It's just adding another line or two that just says that's the example. And then uh, finally, 141 was the uh, Perenjay's patch, which I think Alexi just merged last night or this morning, right? So this is already in the BPF next tree. Um, and so the, here was the issue that was just tracking that. And so those are the only four things that have come in across the last four weeks. All right. I'm done talking about the ISA, I hope. Last call for comments on the ISA? Okay. I guess you have until tomorrow. All right. Um, so what's the next steps? Once we're done with the ISA, then that means the top bullet on the charter is now considered complete. Okay. And we look at the next things, and I mentioned they're kind of in approximately chronological order, more or less, right? Just because later things may have dependencies in earlier things. Later documents may have normative references to things higher on the list. And so you can do some of them concurrently, but what you can't do is you can't do a later one without starting the earlier one, right? You can do two in parallel because the later one will often reference the earlier one, okay? And so um, until Daniel calls time, then uh, I will talk uh, one slide about each of like the next three or four things, okay? But I have permission to go until I think quarter after, right? Okay. So let me talk about uh, one slide on verifier expectations and just to kind of level set because all of this is, uh, you know, things that the IETF doesn't have consensus on yet. So if you have thoughts, if you want to talk about this, then great. Then you're kind of signing up to be a reviewer or maybe even contributing text or something, so. All right, so the, the, the line was verifier expectations and building blocks for allowing safe execution of untrusted BPF programs. That's what the charter says now. Um, and we've heard some discussion, I think earlier this, you know, was it yesterday or whatever, that was uh, maybe a request for what it might say, uh, or at least some request that it should say something. Um, so it's intended to describe what a verifier is expected to ensure. So as examples of things that might be in there, okay, Maybe you want to argue that one of these should not be in there. Maybe you got something else to add into there. That's not the point. The point is to advertise, here's the type of stuff that might be in there, okay? Things like your verifier is responsible for, or perhaps not responsible for, um, are there making sure that there's not use of undefined instructions or registers? Is all the behavior defined, right? This is like Alan's question um, yesterday. 
uh, adherence to API contracts, right? Does it actually adhere to the prototype and pass a number instead of a pointer where something is supposed to be, right? Uh, is memory pointer dereferencing safe? Does it actually terminate within some definition of termination, like maximum number of instructions, right? Um, and so the job of the document is to say which ones of these or which other things does respond is a verifier supposed to do versus that being the job of something else, okay? Um, there are a number of documents that we can pull text from or at least pull data from to construct text. Uh, the most obvious one is verifier.rst that's currently in the, in the tree. Uh, it's not under the standardization folder because it's not written in a way that's ready for standardization, but it contains lots of great details. Uh, it contains lots of details that's very specific to the Linux kernel verifier, like what's the path to the .h file, and what's the C pound defines, and things like that that wouldn't necessarily be in the standardization, but the abstract version of it, a lot of the information is there. So that's presumably the source of a lot of the information that would go into uh, the, the uh, standardization directories version. Then there's also things like um, there's various academic papers that describe what is a verifier, right? Um, what does a verifier do? And so things like the prevail paper that's in PLDI 19. Um, there's also various emails, such as the one that just happened like within the last week. That was one of the subject line, what security properties does verifier guarantee? And we got some good answers. And so that thread is actually a decent documentation of that with you know, Alexi's answer and so on, right? So there's plenty of source material. And it's just a matter of somebody to go through the stuff, pull out the right sentences, and construct the document. Um, that might be uh, a lot of it from verifier.rst, for example. Okay. And so that's kind of the next step there on the verifier document, is somebody just needs to do that work and create the first draft using the source material. Yeah. Okay. Oh, it would be very nice if this document would take shape in the form of uh, some sort of, uh, of rules or constraints with numbers for them. Because okay. on the compiler side, it will be quite useful for us that we could refer to them. OK, you when mean like a requirement to... number or something? Because some documents say, you know, requirement one, requirement two, requirement three, and they don't care what order you do them in, you just have to meet the requirements. Do you mean that or something else? Yeah, uh, yeah I mean, I mean like rules like, for example, uh, it's not allowed to apply an offset to this particular register when it contains this particular pointer that has been tracked since the beginning of the function, stuff like that. Okay. If that you is have the kind ideas of things for, that. Yeah. If compiler optimizations may break at some point. So okay. if we introduce a modification in the compiler to optimize differently, it would be nice to be able to refer to this particular rule in the document. I or think this is more compiler, whatever, yeah. not expectations was the right word. Yeah, I think there was one here. Uh, the fourth bullet down, the, this one, we'll get to like compiler expectations. Oh, yeah, something like this. So okay. that's that's. <clears throat> I I think what you're saying is useful. It's yeah, but maybe not the document. No, but I mean, if you look at things like memory models or or other like formal method-ish requirements, people number the rules or give them names so you can easily reference them and. I think where you're getting is if the compiler would do an optimization that would break and verifier expectation, the compiler could do, well, print a diagnostic, put it in a comment, whatever. Right? Well, yeah, we are now thinking on introducing, as we discussed recently, um, this concept of compilers optimizing compilers generating verifiable code. Mm -hmm. So what this means to be verifiable. So we, you can have different profiles, actually. So it will, be, it will help a lot to say, okay, verifiable in this case means this rule, this rule, this rule, this constraint, this constraint, this constraint. So I hear you saying, I, I mentioned ones lower on the list could have references to one higher on the list, okay? And so uh, it could be that there's text that we want to put into one that talks about compiler expectations that then somehow refers to what's in the verifier in order to explain what the compiler is supposed to do or could do. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I don't insist which document it should be, but it would be nice to have some sort of formalized expectations for verifiers. It's like if you look at the like kernel memory model, where basically every rule has a referenceable uh, identifier that you can talk about. Yeah, I'm yeah, not against the identifiers at all. It's just somehow, like, <clears throat> when we discuss the charter and what will be in this verifier expectations, somehow, like, it's not, well, I didn't think that that, that would be expectations for the verifier, for one verifier, another verifier, or something else. 
and compiler kind of what compiler wants to see and compiler sort of rules what compiler is supposed to do will be different. There is some overlap, like you're saying, like if verifier does not understand this, that compiler can refer to it, like here rule one, two, three, five, do that. But like compiler would probably have like different things. Like it would need to like look at PSABI. It would need to like <coughs> be aware that uh, memory model exists. Yeah, but maybe, maybe to frame it different, right? I mean, the, if we put specific identifiers on it or not, and I'm very much in the pro camp, is very much a low level decision when writing the document. And the best way to get what you want is just to be active on the mailing list and either send patches or commands. And yeah. that's a very good way to get it in. And I think you will. <laughs> yeah. Thank you for volunteering to provide feedback. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, next bullet is about BTF. Okay. There's an existing BTF.RST already in the tree, but not under standardization. Uh, obviously, that's a good starting point for what goes in the standardization. Uh, so presumably the first step is to do some format transformations from btf.rst to create a file under standardization. And so the sorts of things that we've done in the instruction set RST when doing that, like right now there's an agreement to use the ITF packet format for structures instead of type tests and tables instead of defines. And so there, there are things that's just, you know, algorithmic transforms of what the, uh, how it's documented this way to how it's documented that way so that it matches what uh, instruction set RST does. Um, I, I don't know if there's other major questions there, although you see I referred to this on the next slide too, but this one seems like it's a pretty straightforward next step, so. Um, now, this bullet here says one or more, doesn't say one, it says one or more documents, meaning the working group gets to choose whether it's one document, two documents, three documents, or something else. And if you want to split it into fine grain stuff or to combine them together, IETF you know, leadership doesn't care. The working group gets to decide what we think makes sense. Okay? They recommend conventions and guidelines for producing portable BPF program binaries. So the two things that I most commonly heard grouped into here, which could be two documents, right, which is compiler expectations and PSABI. Okay? And so that's what I'm going to talk about. I'll get different slides on there under the assumption that they could be two documents. Okay? Okay? But they're both in that same bullet there as far as the, the working group is concerned. Okay? So PSABI. Um, is the only other file that's currently in uh, the standardization directory today. It's real short. It's about 10 lines long. It contains a, a paragraph that was uh, moved out of instruction set RST a long time ago. Uh, and so the proposed scope, this is me proposing what that document might do, uh, because as you saw back here, the PSABI, this bullet here is labeled as informational, not proposed standard. We could argue to change that. It just means that the area director has to approve. Okay. Um, and so if you say that there could be more than one ABI across different runtimes, now that's not desirable, and so we'd want to call that out. This says trying to have multiple of them is probably a bad idea. But if you have an offload card that needs to have, or a set of offload cards that need to have its own ABI that's different from the Linux kernel ABI for some reason, it's not disallowed. Okay. And so what would you have to do if you wanted to allow that? Because right now we know of at least, I think, two ABIs that are out there that are almost entirely overlapping. I think Alan mentioned uh, yesterday that UBPF has a marginally different um, ABI and that uh, when calling a program type, it also passes another argument that's the size of the context. Okay. You know. R1 contains the context pointer, and R2 contains size of context, and so on. So you could argue that's, an eight, that's a calling convention that eight, that's specific to UBPF, right? And so if UBPF wanted to document that, then they'd have to have a way of documenting that. So anyway, um, whether it should or not, different question. That's not what I want to talk about. What I want to talk about is the ABI document. So the proposed scope that I currently have in mind uh, is my proposal anyway, uh, is to say, first of all, if you are going to define an ABI, or if you're going to rev the current ABI, because Linux adds, you know, whether it's more registers or defines a way to return stuff differently, whatever it is, it's an ABI change. Okay? Then here's the sets of questions you have to answer when defining an ABI document. Okay? And it actually defines an ABI that answers all those questions so that you have the, the current ABI in there okay, that answers those questions. But it says, if you ever were to make another one, okay, then you must cover these questions here. That's what defines as being an APS ABI. So we don't have to keep having these questions in other contexts. It says, Christoph says an ABI contains whatever, and this other organization doesn't know that. Okay? We say, you should be using this one. And we say, don't define your own, use this one. Uh, but for some reason, if this doesn't work for you, here's the requirements you'd have to do. 
So how can you best disincent it while providing a set of minimum requirements for, for APIs to API documents? So that's what I'm currently thinking. And then if there exists, if there's allowed to be more than one, then how do you tell a, I mentioned this in my talk on uh, Monday, if you're building, say, a compiler, and you know that there's two ABIs out there and you want to generate code, you would typically have to know which ABI you're generating it for because you'd have to generate a couple of instructions different, right? So how do you name that, right? Um, what would you put, because we had names for conformance groups, and I talked about what you want to do in like a compiler to say, I want to only use instructions out of the following con conformance groups. What if there's two ABIs out there and I have to name them? Do we have to have a naming convention or something to say, is it, is it the Linux one or is it the only other one that exists? I don't know. But I don't want there to be more than two, but who knows, okay? But at least say, these are questions that the ITF has to answer. So you may have opinions on this. This isn't the time to have those. The point is the discussion, the document is what should um, answer those. Okay. Um, and then the last one that we had some uh, comments about, I think yesterday, um, uh, somebody mentioned my document here. Um, and so just the history on that one, if you're uh, new to this discussion, is that there's an existing file, elf.rst, in the repo. And so draft there BPF elf is a derivative that contains some information from that, some information from btf.rst, um, because there was, uh, I was doing it in one document instead of two, and so yeah, you can argue that it's in the wrong place, uh, but that's just where it came from. You see the file name is draft thaler, it's not draft IETF. Working group documents start with draft IETF in the file name. Uh, things that are not part of the IETF, but maybe contributions to the IEF, start with draft surname, or draft you know, something that's not IETF, okay? So this is not an IETF document, just to be clear, even though somebody referenced it yesterday. This is my personal document um, as a contribution of a starting point. And the IETF is free, is free to uh, throw it out, to start from it and do the real thing or whatever. So um, I was doing it as I was trying to do an implementation that needed information that I couldn't find, and so I wanted to put it someplace. Um, so it was a placeholder since I was doing IETF stuff. It also contains some to-dos that really depend on the BTF spec. And so the point is you can't do this until after you've done the BTF spec anyway. And then the stuff that I moved out of the BTF dot rst into here wouldn't need to be in here. That's the uh, debug and line information. Now the real question on the ELF profile is to whether it's part of that bullet or not, this one or more documents about part guidelines for producing portable BPF program binaries. Okay. There was a debate uh, at the time that when that language was first created, that language I just read, as to whether ELF profile should actually be in the IETF or not. And I don't want to necessarily repeat that here, but for everybody other than Alexi and Kristoff and me that were part of that debate, here's what we talked about and here's the arguments, okay? Um, so uh, ELF itself is not an IETF spec, it's I think System 5. And the uh, original intent uh, when, at least when I created that document there, my hope, okay, was that a BPF specific profile could be an IETF, and some people were arguing that we should just do the, the ELF profile in IETF, so all the BPF documents are in the same place, okay? So that's the argument there that says, well, everything else is there, that's what the community is reviewing BPF documents, not over in you know, the ELF community per se, um, or the System 5 community anyway. Um, but uh, that discussion, I would not say, we didn't necessarily call consensus on it. We constructed the wording of the charter to be agnostic as to whichever way that falls, right? So the argument against it is roughly falls back to this notion that the document has, when you put in the ELF header, there's a field that's the e-machine. The e-machine, there's a specific value for BPF that's not defined in any System 5 spec, okay? So you can argue that BPF is kind of squatting on that space as far as System 5 is concerned because you have to find some place. As long as you can find a document that has that, then the IETF can say this is not normative, it's just referencing that. But that's the only exception. What's that? That's the only exception, everyone does that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's the only bit of it that if you use ELF properly, if yeah, you use yeah. the operating system yeah. specific right. now we're getting back to so the on, thing. Yeah. Christoph was the one that was there. Uh, well, so. you have had this discussion yeah. so anyway, already. Right? Yeah, yeah. And, and, and what you said before, I mean, when you say the System 5 community, I mean, yeah. there's not, right? I mean, when SEO was still alive, they yeah. used to publish a somewhat semi-regular yeah. update of the list. And basically, it's completely defunct. And right. We probably should spend some effort to figure out how we can define a, a register the e-machine value as right. official as possible. Right. And I don't think it will be quite up to IDF standards and we'll have to live with it. Yeah. But except for that, we just have to find a place where we can yeah. work. So, so the hope is 
that saying this that document is someone is, who worked for yeah. SEO when it was still kind of alive. So the hope <laughs> is that this document can just reference that value, even if there's some other registry somewhere that's authoritative that says number 247 means BPF, then this document just says, now that that's been assigned, right, here's the conventions for what you do in your ELF file, and then it can be in the ITF. It right? is just a mailing list. You just have to send an email saying, yeah. I request an location for the EMBPF period, it, and it, anything else you can do in your own. It, the GNU extensions to ELF, for example, are in a GitHub, repo yeah. in a GitHub repository. Uh, the ones for Intel, or the one for LLVM, for example, they are in the in the LLVM source, source tree. Yeah. And the ones for the Linux kernel, by the way, are in the kernel, because the kernel also defines things like specific ELF node types. So, so it, Jose, if you're volunteering to take care of that, then that will make this discussion be really easy, because then the ITF can just adopt the document, because it's already in the registry that you're talking about, right? Yeah, you just yeah, need somebody yeah, to do yeah. that. Okay. So I don't think it's a problem yeah. at all. Yeah, yeah. But I'm saying that was where the debate was, just how, what do we do with this value, how do we get it registered, and so on. And that's why the IETF discussion was punted. Okay. And so we still got to get back to that, and now is about the right time to get back to it now that we're finishing the ISA. Okay. That's the end of my slide. It's 5.15. I'm right on time. I'm done. <laughs> so so just, just a comment on your last point. I'm oh, sure. Questioning if both <laughs> document. I, I, I think the language is weaselly enough that it's clearly in scope if we wanted to. Correct. It was it was it was designed so that that was the answer. That the answer is sort of the answer that they wanted was it should be in scope if we wanted it, and therefore the language was crafted in order to have that meaning. Okay. By the way, EMPPF is in the UAPI header already in the kernel. Yeah. And also in case, I mean, PSABI yeah. in theory is for processor specific yeah. ABI, and basic ELF, the GELF, the general ELF, it provides extension points for both operating systems and machines, when it calls machines. Yeah. And for example, the operating system one doesn't have to be a real one. Again, Clang, for example, LLVM, they use the operating system specific ranges for extensions mm -hmm. for some extensions. So that's another. Okay. Uh, uh, range for extension that you could use if you wanted to. Okay. So what I'm hearing is that nobody has any big concerns about it being done in the IETF. There's, there's some stuff that has to happen, but there's no reason that the profile itself couldn't be done in the IETF. That's kind of, nobody's argument against that. It's just about how you get that to happen. So I'm happy to hear that. Okay. In that case, I will All right. Thank you off. very much.